Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to the Spotify Q2 2020 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. If you require any further assistance, please press star zero. Thank you. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker for today. Paul Vogel, Chief Financial Officer, please go ahead. Great. Thank you and welcome to Spotify's second quarter 2020 earnings conference call. I hope everyone is continuing to stay safe. As is the case with just about everyone, our team again will be hosting this call entirely remotely. Our CEO, Daniel Eck, is participating from Stockholm, and I am, my, I am at my home office in New Jersey. This morning, I'm pleased to introduce our new head of investor relations, Brian Goldberg, who just recently joined our team. I'm sure many of you recognize his name from his time at Bank of America. Also joining the IR team is Lauren Katzen, who was previously on our licensing finance team within FPNA. We're excited to have both of them on board. Mike Ursioli, who has been both part of our IR team and FPNA teams over the past few years, is transitioning into an expanded role within FPNA, but will be on hand to answer questions post this quarter and for the next few weeks. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Paul. Turning now to the call, we'll start with opening comments from Daniel. After the remarks, Daniel and Paul will be happy to answer your questions. Like last quarter, we'll be taking questions exclusively through Slido. Questions can be submitted by going to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and using the code hashtag Spotify earnings. Analysts can ask questions directly into Slido, and all participants can then vote on the questions they find the most relevant. If for some reason you don't have access to Slido, you can email investor relations at ir at spotify.com, and we'll add in your question. Before we begin, let me quickly cover the safe harbor. During the call, we'll be making certain forward-looking statements, including projections or estimates about the future performance of the company. These statements are based upon current expectations and assumptions that are subject to risks and uncertainties. Actual results could materially differ because of factors discussed on today's call in our letter to shareholders and in filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission. During this call, we'll also refer to certain non-IFRS financial measures. Reconciliations between our IFRS and non-IFRS financial measures can be found in our letter to shareholders in the financial section of our investor relations page and also furnished today on Form 6K. And with that, I will turn it over to Daniel. All right. Hey, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. Like all of you, Spotify continues to navigate issues related to COVID-19 and racial injustice, both of which are reshaping our industry and society in significant ways. Given the role we play in culture, we believe Spotify has a responsibility to use our platform to help build a more equitable future. For us, that means focusing on what's core to our business, amplifying the music and perspectives of black creators and taking every opportunity to connect them with current and future fans. We're also taking a hard look at what we can do to build a more equitable workplace. And we have committed to increasing representation of black employees at all levels within Spotify. When we do this right, it's good for employees, good for creators and good for shareholders. Now turning to the quarter, we're pleased with our results, which met or exceeded our guidance by almost every metric. After making adjustments to help us weather the pandemic in Q1, consumption returned to normal levels this quarter. Monthly active users increased to 299 million and subscribers grew to 138 million, both exceeding our expectations. Advertising revenue, which took a significant hit in Q1, improved notably throughout the quarter, and we feel good about our momentum as we enter Q3. We also continue to invest in our audio first strategy signing exclusive deals with some of the world's most well-known creators and most powerful voices. Earlier today, we launched the first episode of the Michelle Obama podcast, and it features a conversation with a very special guest, President Barack Obama. Our podcast catalog now has over 1.5 million shows, 50% of which launched in 2020. And while it's been gratifying to see so much enthusiasm for these announcements throughout the quarter, It's important to remember that with many of our newest shows, we're still early in the progress. In some cases, like DC Comics, we need to produce the content, and in others, like Joe Rogan, it has yet to launch on our platform. There's still work to do and much more to come. On the music front, we enter a new multi-year global license agreement with Universal Music Group that reflects our shared commitment in growing the industry and supporting artists at all stages of their careers. Universal Music Group will leverage Spotify's marketplace tools for both frontline and catalog artists 
to connect them with fans, grow their audiences, and better monetize their fan base. And we'll also work together to develop new products and tools that drive discovery and engagement at a scale that has never before existed. Spotify has now surpassed 60 million tracks globally, giving artists even more opportunities to connect with their biggest fans. And just last week, Taylor Swift's surprise release of her new album, Folklore, broke the number one first day record for a female artist album in Spotify's history. She also became the most streamed artist on Spotify on any day this year, with nearly 98 million streams on July 24th alone. Finally, I would like to address our business overall. Investors often ask me what our secret sauce is, expecting that there's some sort of silver bullet to our growth. The reality is that at a platform of our scale, it's rarely about one thing. Instead, it's about setting up a culture of experimentation and being willing, willing to double down on opportunities if we believe they have the potential to enhance the user experience and change the slope of our growth curve. And I want to share two recent examples that I think exemplifies this point. Over the last two years, we've tripled the number of experiments from a few hundred to thousands of A-B tests. Some of these experiments yield nothing more than a few key learnings, while others have shown great promise. Uh, in one of our recent podcast experiments, we increased listening among the test group by 33%. And that's just one example of many. And when we see results like this, you should expect us to invest even more. And we know that no one experiment is going to materially impact us even in the next year. It's the thousands of little things that we're doing which will gradually add up over time. The second example I want to point is, is new market launches. Just this month, we launched in Russia and 12 other European countries. And our first week in Russia was huge, even bigger than our first week in India. So if we do this right, we have the opportunity to reach 250 million more listeners in these markets over the long term. And we're now operating in nearly every country across Europe, but there's still a lot of pent up demand for Spotify in markets around the world, which is why we have plans for further expansion globally. And what these two recent examples underscore is that staying focused on the long-term growth whilst managing for speed of iteration near-term is what will drive future growth. And using that lens and with the examples I gave, I think it is apparent that we still have many more improvements left to make. And that's also why we keep investing. And with that, I'll turn it back to Brian. Thanks, Daniel. Again, if you have any questions, please go to slido.com. Hashtag Spotify earnings. We'll read the questions in the order they come in with respect to how people vote up their preference for questions. And the first question today is going to come from Eric Sheridan. Can you frame the impacts you expect long term in your business from greater podcast content consumption, lower churn, greater gross ad share of streamed audio, increased long term ad supported gross margins? Um. Well, it's, it's really about taking a step back. And I think what we're seeing here is the beginning of a flywheel. So as we talked about before, Spotify is now going after all of audio, and that's obviously a significantly larger market uh, than just the music industry in and on itself. And so what we're seeing is that by every piece of content that we're adding on the service that we're successfully serving to a consumer, we're creating more engagement. That engagement in turn leads to obviously lower churn, but uh, more importantly, now that we have almost 300 million monthly active users on the platform, these users are also, when they find great shows, sharing that on social media and other forums to other consumers as well, uh, driving this virtuous cycle where more and more people are learning about uh, what's going on on Spotify and uh, more and more creators want to be on Spotify creating this virtuous uh, flywheel. So um, with the expansion of podcasts, we're definitely seeing more of that, and it's happening at a faster clip than what we've seen before, and we're very encouraged by it. Yeah, and then from a, a numbers perspective, um, I would say everything you mentioned um, is what we're looking at to, to value each piece of content. So it's, it is the combination of what is it doing for our user growth, what is it doing to improve retention and lower churn, and then also, how can we grow advertising on top of it? And so when we look at pieces of content and we look at how much we need to add and, and where we're spending, it's really about the LTV uh, of the overall uh, spend on content 
and how it impacts holistically the entire business, you know, from user growth to subscriber growth to advertising growth. Okay, great. Next question from Rich Greenfield. What percentage of ad revenue is now directly tied to podcasting? Trying to understand what ad supported music revenues were down year over year relative to 21% overall ad decline in the quarter as podcasting growth and acquisition first time benefits presumably benefited the 21% decline. Yeah, so I would say a couple things on this. One is, um, you know, podcasting is still reasonably small relative to the overall amount of, of advertising. Um, that being said, it did outperform in the quarter, and we felt it was uh, one of the stronger areas of growth, which is great. Um, um, hopefully, everyone has, has seen the, uh, the deal we struck with Omnicom at the uh, last couple of weeks, um, which is a $20 million deal to invest in, in podcast advertising moving forward, which we're really um, excited about. And the other thing about podcasting is it's having you know, a couple of effects. One is overall podcast uh, growth is there, and so we finished uh, this quarter at 21% of MAU, which is up from 19%. Uh, you know, podcast consumption is still up over 100%, and we're seeing advertisers really wanting to invest uh, in podcasting as a media. The other thing that's, that's benefiting us is we're starting to sell more uh, media deals across all of our products, and so we're seeing nice growth from deals that incorporate both music advertising and podcasting advertising in the deals. Um, and so, in general, you know, podcast was, was strong in the quarter. Um, it's still reasonably small, but growing very nicely. Okay, next question from Eric Sheridan. Can you update investors on your views on acquiring licensing podcasting content? What will drive either approach? Any update on the level of investments in podcasts? And how critical is putting podcast content exclusively on your own platform against your long-term goals for the business model? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we are really pursuing uh, sort of um, all strategies in tandem. It's really all about creating the best overall user experience, as I talked about before with this virtual cycle. Uh, now, that said, exclusivity uh, is a key component of that strategy. Uh, we want to create more and more original programming that only exists on Spotify. And I think this quarter you started seeing um, some of those announcements come in in a big way. And obviously, that's something we're pursuing uh, with creators, but, but it's important that we are an open platform and we're seeing more and more content. Um, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, over a million and a half uh, shows are now available on Spotify, and about 50% of them was created in 2020. It's uh, impossible, even if we wanted to, to have all of that content exclusively on our platform. So it's going to be a mix of all of those things going forward. Okay, next question from Richard Kramer. With the UMG deal, has Spot secured any firm commercial commitment to pay for two-sided marketplace services? So uh, as we talked about before, we're very, very excited about uh, Marketplace and the momentum it's having. Uh, we're seeing lots and lots of uh, big uh, artists come in. We saw John Legend. We saw the 1975 uh, Lady Gaga, among many others, adopt the tools this quarter. Uh, so we're very excited about it. Uh, and with the U Universal Music Group announcement, uh, they're really now leaning in uh, because of that um, uh, really early excitement in the marketplace um, and uh, want to adopt more tools and, and want to go deeper because they're seeing the potential impact that it can have on their business. Next question from Eric Sheridan. Can you give us a sense of how the ad market evolved over the recent quarter in terms of ad budgets, pricing, and how you see those dynamics evolving against the current macro backdrop? Can you provide color on any variability by industry verticals, geographies, or type of ad budget? Yes, yeah, so the, the advertising market, um, it definitely started, the, the quarter started off slow. We mentioned um, coming out of Q1 that the last three weeks of Q1 were, uh, were pretty weak and saw some, some big declines, and that continued into uh, April and May. We were actually running behind on the ads business for April and May, probably down about 25% um, on those two months. And then we really had a nice pickup in June. June was only down about 10% uh, on the advertising side. Uh, in terms of um, geographies, I'm not going to get, get into specifics, but we have a, a much higher percentage of our revenue on the ad side comes from North America than on the premium side. So uh, how North America goes tends to be how um, our overall business goes. Um, and then... In terms of product, uh, the direct business was weak in the quarter um, and actually underperformed our expectations. Uh, and we were uh, very strong on our ad studio, which is our self-service tool, which outperformed. Uh, and as I mentioned uh, above, podcasting outperformed as well. 
Okay, next question from Michael Morris. Is the level of podcast engagement similar across both premium and ad-supported users? Are you seeing a difference in churn for podcast users? If so, can you quantify the relative impact? Um, so at a high level, I would say, you know, the good news is that podcast engagement in general uh, overall is increasing. So as I mentioned, we're now 21% of our MAU engaged with podcasts, which is up from 19%. Um, and consumption was up over 100% in the quarter. So we continue to see it, it going up in general. Um, premium does have uh, higher engagement than um, the, uh, the ad-supported business, but both of them have been moving up uh, nicely, and both of them have been uh, improving. And with respect to, to any impacts on trend, we don't break that on individually. Okay, next question from Doug Amoth. Do you expect podcasts to have a bigger financial impact through advertising dollars or more through incremental premium subscribers to the platform? I would really say it depends on what the time horizon is that you're looking at it. Uh, obviously, our subscription business is a much larger business. So even if we improve that by a small percentage base, that's likely going to uh, be a larger impact than, than even if we improved our advertising business with, with a strong double digits growth as well. So I think in the short term, any improvement we can make on improving retention is going to be material um, to the subscription business. And that's how you should look at it. But long term, when I look at the landscape, what excites me is that we're going after all of audio. And all of audio is a multi-billion user opportunity. And it's a marketplace that um, it, only in its existing form today, uh, it's north of $50 billion in advertising revenue. And it's the combination of subscription and advertising long-term that I think is the future of media businesses. And Spotify has really since its inception played in both, both of these businesses. Uh, so I'm very excited about uh, long-term both being a uh, principal player in advertising as well in, as in subscription. Um, and, and so over the long term, it will become a bigger part of our business. And I would just add, which I think I mentioned earlier, when we look at some of the larger content deals we've done, uh, we are measuring um, or forecasting both sides of the equation in terms of how we, um, how we value the, that content moving forward. Okay, uh, another question here from Doug. Can you talk about the, how the recent universal deal may treat the two-sided marketplace differently than other recently signed label deals, or are they essentially the same? Well, I think the big difference here uh, is really uh, Universal's willingness to uh, experiment and um, go all in on marketplace. Uh, and that's what I think should be the bigger takeaway here for all investors as well. Um, so what that means in essence is uh, Universal has seen the early success. It's very excited by it and they want to make sure that it, it can get behind and experiment a lot more with uh, the paid tools of Marketplace, but also the organic tools that allows artists to um, create more fans, engage with those fans and monetize those fans uh, better. And so overall, we wanna work with all labels, but we're very, very encouraged to see uh, Universal go all in on uh, the tools and services that we're building. Okay, next question from Mark Mahaney. Where can ad-supported gross margins go near-term, and long-term, can these gross margins match those of premium? Yeah, so in the very long term, uh, we definitely think ad um, gross margins could reach uh, the premium gross margins. Um, we haven't given a time frame on that, but we believe that's, that's, um, that's where we're headed. Um, you know, in the near term, there's a couple of factors uh, at play here. One, obviously, is, is the weaker uh, overall ad environment, uh, which is impacting gross margins. Um, and particularly on the ad side, there are some uh, minima that we pay in certain markets where uh, the advertising uh, hasn't, reached, hasn't quite reached critical mass. And so as we get to a tipping point in some of those markets on the music side, the gross margin will improve. And then additionally, um, just a reminder, we, we now account for all of the cost of podcasting in our ad-supported business. So the entire brunt of the investment we're making on the content side um, is hitting the ad-supported line. And so as we continue to invest in content, um, the ads business will um, – uh, you know, we'll feel it more. Uh, we do expect um, ads gross margins to uh, to improve in Q3 and then be even better in Q4. Our next question is from Stephen Cahal. What do you expect will be the impact to MAUs, premium subs, and gross profit when the Joe Rogan experience comes exclusive to Spotify in September? 
I think it's too early to talk about um, what the impact will be. Um, yes, we obviously know it's a big show, and uh, we are encouraged by the reception we've seen in the marketplace. Uh, so I do think uh, a lot of his fans are very excited uh, about the announcement. But it's going to take time, and we uh, we have to learn how to uh, market and merchandise um, the Joe Rogan show, um, both to his existing fans uh, as well as to all of the other 300 uh, million or so listeners on Spotify um, as well. Because this, uh, as we have talked about before, even with the announcement of Joe Rogan, this was the number one uh, searched for show um, on Spotify that we're now including. So I think it's going to be a very, very positive one. But uh, again, I think the best way to think about this is that uh, Spotify is not about one single show. Uh, it, it is really about the drumbeat now of new uh, exclusive content, original programming, and the one and a half million uh, podcasts that exist on the platform uh, that's growing at a very, very rapid pace. So there's something for everyone. That's the message uh, I want you to take away. The next question is from Rich Greenfield. Howard Stern's multi-year agreement with Sirius expires at the end of this calendar year. If you were Howard Stern, why would you want to be on Spotify versus Sirius? Um, I can't really speak to Howard Stern uh, specifically. Uh, what I can say, though, as you've seen in the quarter, um, there are more and more great um, creators around the world that are turning to Spotify. And I think part of that reason is because this is an interactive medium. This allows them to better connect um, with um, their audience, seeing the data, seeing how they're uh, engaging with the content, seeing the feedback uh, directly. It is an international uh, platform too, uh, not just the domestic. So while we are very large in North America, we are equally large in Europe and Latin and Asia as well. Uh, so this is a global audio platform unlike anything else. And now thirdly, the size of platforms that may operate in just one market. Um, so I think the combination of that interactivity, um, the flexibility that it allows you and the global nature and scale of this platform is what excites a lot of creators to be on our platform. Next question is from Richard Kramer. How will you get the local data to, to target podcast ads you intend to insert? Will each host have to record a large number of ads, which will be inserted depending on local interests, customer segment, et cetera? So uh, I'll take this and maybe Paul, you uh, can chime in as well. So um, just to level set with everyone, there's a number of different um, tools that we have um, in our podcasting advertising sets. And uh, the, the uh, host read ads is one of them. And what we call SAI is uh, something uh, very different. Uh, so specifically to address the question on our host read ads, the, host itself decides among another different brands that it wants to work with and then reads those ads in and then Spotify serves that based to to the audience that best suits the advertiser's intent. And then with SAI, it's more dynamically created ads that um, are uh, set in. Some of them are recorded by the, the, the advertiser themselves um, um, and some of them are host read ads as well that are, are uh, baked into the mix. But this is a very, very nascent marketplace that exists today. So generally speaking, when it comes to podcasts, a lot of this data that we're now talking about that's become standard on the internet has not existed. So um, what, what I think the general trend has been is that when you have it, add internet level uh, data and um, accessibility of those tools, uh, the performance of those ads goes up. And when the performance of those goes ad ads goes up, the value goes up as well, both to the creator and to the platform as well. So we're, we're very, very excited about bringing internet level um, advertising technology to the podcast medium. And this is something that I, that I am very, very encouraged by and that I think you should look out for for the next coming um, quarters and years. Next question is from Michael Kling. Can you elaborate on how you expect the addition of video will impact the growth of Spotify's advertising business? Is it realistic for investors to expect a positive impact in the next 12 months? 
Yeah, uh, yeah. So uh, I think the way you should look at video overall is it's yet another capability uh, that we're adding for creators to to connect to fans as well. And um, it, it's just uh, in in this quarter as well with discovery of podcast where uh, the podcast charts are coming in. Um, and more and more tools and data that we're adding to podcasters as well. This is another innovation as well to allow uh, podcasters to creatively express themselves in a different way. Uh, so you should expect us to iterate on that. Now, that said, we are an audio first platform. And so we expect for the foreseeable future, the majority of consumption to be um, audio meaning that consumers that watch video will go in and out of the video experience and then being able to put that uh, experience in their pocket and continue. And then when they hear something interesting, pull it back up and then watch the show again. So this is, you should not look at this as uh, some of the other platforms like YouTube and Snap where it's predominantly a lean-in experience. A video is an added capability. Uh, it is priced uh, very attractively for advertisers but the share of video on Spotify is uh, 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 low right now and it will be growing, but I don't think you should expect it to be another YouTube. Next question from Matt Thornton. On podcasts, can you give some color on one, what percent of hours are currently monetizable and how is that trending? Two, how current ad loads and CPM stack up versus industry average? And three, the third party ad network opportunity. Yeah, so um, we don't really disclose uh, ad loads particularly, but I'd say they're pretty close to industry uh, averages. I would say in general, what's really interesting, and I think Daniel touched on this, is as you get better at targeting when you have tools like SAI, um, you're able to actually increase your monetization, um, increase the relevancy of the ads, uh, and increase overall monetization without actually having to increase the overall ad load. So we feel really optimistic that our technology and the innovation we're bringing to technology will allow for greater monetization um, uh, over time uh, and in doing it in a way where you don't necessarily have to increase uh, ad loads. In some cases, you might even be able to lower ad loads if you're able to target the ads more specifically to, to users with a, with a har higher ROI. Um, and in terms of a third-party ad network opportunity, um, it's, it's definitely something potentially longer term uh, we, could, we could look into. Um, we know that when we launched SAI, uh, which is only on our owned and operated properties, uh, the number of inbound calls we got from folks who had interest in using that technology as well uh, was pretty high. So um, nothing to announce at this point in time, but obviously something we would we would potentially consider. One thing I would add also, um, I think part of this question was how where we are in, in just the rollout of this. So we're very, very early days. So the expectation I want everyone to have is the vast majority of advertising you hear on Spotify today is the burnt in ads that the podcasters themselves have served. Uh, Spotify does not participate in that. But by building out tools like SAI and host red ads, uh, which are a lot more efficient and better for the advertisers, better for the creator as well, uh, we expect um, that to mean um, a, a lot more adoption in the coming quarters as well. So just want to make everyone aware of that. Next question is from Rich Greenfield. You mentioned a change in the cadence in promotional offers impacting churn. How should we think about the timing length of major promos going forward? Yeah, so I think if you take a step back, um, historically we've run uh, promotional offerings uh, seasonally, so one in the summer and one at the ho holiday period of time every year, uh, which we've done for the last couple of years. Uh, last year, um, we did even more experimentation with offers at different times and different types of offers. And so, for instance, in 4Q of last year, we had an always-on promotion that started earlier in 4Q than normal. Uh, and in Q1 this year, we actually extended the, the normal holiday campaign into uh, Q1, which persisted for, uh, uh, through the early, uh, early parts of February. The seasonal cadence there is that we had um, more folks in Q2 this year coming off of uh, seasonal campaigns than we normally do. Um, so as a result, you normally expect some uptick in churn when you have people rolling off of those promotional offerings. Uh, I would say the um, well, the, the quarter on a quarter, um, year on year churn was down, but quarter on quarter was up uh, modestly, uh, but that was totally expected and in line uh, with our expectations. Uh, and moving forward, you can expect us to continue to experiment. I would say the seasonal campaigns are likely to continue uh, to happen with, with the same regularity. Um, and then we'll experiment with other offerings, other promotions, other regional uh, plans um, over time. 
Next question from Lloyd Walmsley. Can you tell us how much premium gross margins benefited in 2Q relative to year ago from the extended use of the free trial this year versus last year's 99 for three months? What about the total impact to first half premium gross margins? Um, yeah, so in Q2, that impact uh, was small. It was probably about 15, 20 basis points, um, and it had a bigger impact um, in Q1 um, around 80 basis points. So together, uh, it's probably about a, a 40 basis points or so um, for the first half of the year. Next question from Rich Greenfield. The core Apple podcast experience hasn't evolved in years, but there are a wide array of dedicated podcast apps such as Pocket Cast, Overcast, Castro, et cetera. How would you rank the experience of Spotify as a podcast player versus the dedicated apps? Can you become the best place for podcasts? Well, that's certainly our ambition. Um, you know, uh, again, um, what, what, what I've said prior is that we want to be the de facto audio platform of the world. And there's a lot more innovation uh, that we have started doing about two years ago and that we keep shipping quarter by quarter. Um, I think my personal favorite at the moment, uh, which I'm super excited about, is uh, the ability to do group listening remotely. Um, so just as an example, this is something we announced yesterday uh, where uh, consumers can now share what they're currently listening to and people can tune in to that experience, whether that be podcast or whether that be music. Um, but because we have this uh, large music platform and because we have this um, audio platform, all of the benefits that we are developing for the music ecosystem are coming um, to the podcast ecosystem as well. And, and that's true of advertising as well as uh, the discovery uh, tools um, and other usability benefits too. And I think over time, that's gonna compound into an amazing user experience that um, we believe uh, will be attractive to uh, most, if not all consumers around the world who are interested in listening to audio content. Next question comes from Ben Swinburne. <clears throat> Why do you believe COVID-19 pressures seem to persist and be more substantial in Latin America and rest of the world relative to North America? And separately, do you think there has been a reduction in artist releases due to COVID and if that's impacted engagement? That's a very good question. Um, and, and generally, I would say uh, we see some of this seasonality on a market by market basis um, um, as, as well, and not related to COVID, but just due to seasonality, due to holidays, that kind of thing. My best thesis at the moment, um, we've talked about this last quarter that there's been a pull a forward effect of smart devices and smart home um, devices. So smart speakers, smart TV screens, et cetera, exploding in consumption. Uh, this has been a very, very nice tailwind overall. Um, my, my best thesis at the moment is we don't have the same extent of smart devices in LATAM as we do uh, in say more mature uh, markets like North America and Europe. And that can have some of the impact that we're we're seeing uh, as well on that. But that's a uh, that's my own thesis, and and not something that I can sort of uh, uh, just confirm on a broader um, basis. Next question from Sumant Wahi. Can you talk about the margin profile of the podcast business in the shape of the ROI? What are your expectations there? Yeah, so I think, um, as we've talked about, in the short term, short to intermediate term, we're still in investment mode, and we're going to continue to invest in the business, and um, you'll see the, the content um, uh, drag on gross margins get, you know, continue for some period of time as advertising grows. Uh, over the long term, we think it should be margin accretive. Um, how long that takes, we'll, we'll have to see, and I think we've said uh, on a couple of occasions that if you continue to see the, the goodness in the business from podcasting, whether it's on user growth or subscriber growth, if we see it impacting uh, the, the retention numbers and churn numbers in a positive way, we're going to continue to invest in that business. And so um, I think you'll see it holistically in our LTV and our LTV to SAC and how we, how we think about that. Um, but it could be, uh, you know, a drag um, for a period of time before it starts to be a benefit, which we think will, will be significant over time. The one added thing I would probably add to uh, what Paul said um, just overall is, uh, that the best measure that we use uh, internally for judging the business success is the LTV to SAC metric. 
And um, in baked into the LTV metric, of course, is the retention of our, our basis. It is about getting exclusive content, uh, and that exclusive content uh, may mean that we are the only place that have that show, which enables pricing power as well. So long term, that's the flywheel. That's the metric that we're focusing on. Um, so uh, we are investing in that business to build a differentiated business uh, compared to all other businesses that exist here. And we think uh, this will be the audio platform on the Internet and that that's a large opportunity and a very valuable opportunity, both with subscription and advertising. Okay, next question comes from Brian Russo. On your recent renewal with UMG, can you confirm this partner has agreed to treat podcasting on your freemium tier in the same manner that the other majors have with regard to a carve-out of listening time? Well, I think what we have said is that um, from a podcasting perspective, the advertising related to uh, podcasting um, will be 100% uh, Spotify's and not shared. Beyond that, I'm not sure we've commented much on any other terms of the uh, of the deals. Okay, next question from Richard Kramer. What ROI do you think you can provide advertisers or labels for their promoted songs? How do you balance that with the legal limitations on payola and consumer expectations around recommendations? Yeah, so, so we have been um, investing in uh, Marketplace for quite some time, and in particular, we have had Marquee uh, being out there. Um, uh, we are always, of course, monitoring consumer satisfaction and making sure that that is high. That's the gauging factor that we're looking into everything. But I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the the onus is behind this. The, the, I, I, I talked about the economics of a label before, but the single largest cost of a label today, unlike before, it used to be that distribution was the single largest cost of a label. Today, the single largest cost of a label is promotion and marketing. And what's so exciting to me is that Spotify is the platform where most people are consuming and discovering content. So if um, labels instead reinvest some of the portion of the marketing spend that they use to promote a market artist on this platform natively, uh, the results should be a lot better. You should see better results for consumers because they're getting more of what they actually like. You should be see better results for artists and la labels as well because they're able to grow their fans a lot better um, at more efficiently priced prices than, say, other um, advertising marketplaces or billboards um, that they've traditionally spent them on. Um, and, of course, for Spotify, it means a higher gross margin um, business as well. So I really do look at this as a win-win-win, where it's better for the consumer, better for artists and labels, and better for Spotify. Okay, next question comes from Stephen Cahal. When users combine into a premium duo account or a family plan, how is this factored into gross ads, net ads, and churn? Um, well, if you're already a subscriber and you just move within plans, you continue to be a subscriber, so there's no change there. Uh, and for gross ads, it's just it'd be new users to the platform. So, um, you know, and with respect to churn, if you're moving from one plan to the other, but you're staying a subscriber, it shouldn't impact churn either. So, um, yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Okay, we've got time for about two or three more questions. Uh, we'll go to Mark Mahaney. Can you talk through the P&L impact so far from the two-sided marketplace and comment on its potential future financial impact? Yeah, so I think we mentioned um, last year that it was about 30 million benefit to, to gross profit. And then to start the year, uh, we said that we expected marketplace to uh, be up about 50% um, uh, of a contribution to, to gross profit in 2020. And so there's no change at all to our expectations for uh, uh, for the year in terms of how marketplace is rolling out uh, and sorry just just sorry just to just to add i know there's um some questions on a, a good majority of that um is uh is is contra cost so it's a benefit to gross margin without revenue there is some revenue attached to the uh the benefits of marketplace but it's reasonably small the majority of the benefit we get is is uh is directly related to the benefits we see directly in the gross margin And the next question comes from Deepak at Barclays. 
with Joe Rogan coming on the platform exclusively in September and other podcasts potentially launching, how are you thinking about the potential benefit to premium subs and MAUs in your third and fourth quarter guidance? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. And to, to piggyback on what Daniel said earlier, um, we've been reasonably conservative with the uh, expectations for how much it benefits our um, our platform. And so when you look at the, the guidance range, again, if you go back to the start of the year, we had mentioned a certain level of conservatism within our guidance, particularly for MAU, with, res with respect to how much potential benefit we're going to see this year from podcasts and podcast launches and, and new content launches. And so um, we definitely have seen continued growth uh, in MAU. As I mentioned earlier, it was up, you know, this year more than it was up at the same time, you know, first half of, of 2019. Uh, and we've seen really nice growth there. Um, but I would say the exact impact uh, modeled in for the benefits of any of the content um, is still um, fairly minor. And so there is some conservatism baked into the, the MAU side with respect to uh, um, the benefit of podcasts and, and new content. One addition I would uh, just make there too is that <clears throat> the uh, the the interesting factor isn't just about one show. It is when you're adding more and more things that only exist on Spotify, like we talked about before. So to the extent that we're looking at this as a, a big event, that's fantastic and that's great, and I'm sure it will have uh, a big um, um, impact with both existing fans and new fans alike. But for me, this is really about adding more and more and more reasons for you to come to Spotify and uh, be on the Spotify ecosystem as well. And with that, uh, I'm very excited about both the launches uh, we've already had, but also the coming uh, announcements in the coming quarters about all the other shows that we're making, um, that uh, there should be something for every single person uh, on the Spotify platform, and more and more of those shows will only exist on Spotify. Okay, we've got a question from Richard Kramer. What precisely are you hoping to gain from the Apple antitrust case? What's your ideal outcome? And given that 70% plus of U.S. subs are on iOS, how would it affect earnings? Uh, Paul, maybe you can talk about the specific impact for us, but but just uh, overall, the most important thing uh, for us is to create uh, platform principles where it's a more fair and equitable uh, marketplace for us and other startups uh, to engage and compete for consumers' attention, time, and, and wallets. Um, we ultimately think this is important not just for Spotify, but actually for the broader ecosystem as well. Um, you know, the best service is the one that should be win, not the one who had an existing platform that we're able to lock in consumers with as well. So that's certainly what we're hoping for as an outcome. And maybe you, Paul, have something more specific on the impact for us. Yeah, nothing other than I think what we said in the past, which is we've grown really, really nicely uh, and really well in the face of some, um, uh, let's say, uh, competitive uh, dynamics that aren't ideal for us in terms of how we can market um, and talk to our consumers within the, the iOS ecosystem. So uh, we feel really good about the growth we've had in spite of the fact that there are limitations that Apple puts on us and our ability to market, promote, uh, and convert our users into, uh, into subscribers. All right, and our last question will come from Ben Swinburne. Product mix shift, largely due to discounted and family plans, continues to benefit users but weigh on ARPU and your year-over-year -year premium revenue growth, which is slowing. Why should shareholders view this trend positively for the long-term earnings power of the business and not a sign of a maturing market? Um, I guess I'll start and I'll see if, if Daniel has any question, uh, comments on this one. But, um, you know, I think for us, we've really been in a mode of, of growing market share. Um, and it's all been about growing users and growing subscribers. And as we've talked about on a number of calls, we really focus on LTV to SAC and making sure that we're adding uh, subscribers that we believe will be profitable and profitable over the long term. Um, and so we continue to add. We've had a lot of success with our family plan and student plan. So the affinity plans have helped us grow our overall subscribers um, and gain share. Um, but we have seen ARPU decline. I was down 9% in the quarter, as I mentioned, 7% um, excluding FX, and there was another 1% impact of the revenue reversal, so uh, down about 6%. I think over long term, our expectation is that ARPU will um, uh, moderate in terms of the declines and start to move higher. Um, but, you know, for now, it's really been about market share gains over uh, near term profitability. And I think the only thing I, I would add to that is uh, we keep looking at all of those um, 
uh, changes in product mix from the lens of just the overall LTV. So there are many variables that go into LTV. One of them, of course, is retention and uh, overall acquisition as well uh, when, when we monitor for that. And as Paul said, we've been mostly focused um, for growth, and I think rightly so, because with the scale of the platform, uh, that enables more and more and more of the benefits that we've been talking about uh, as well. It's easier for us to market to existing consumers when we're doing something like podcasts. Those those consumers are in turn marketing to other new consumers to join the platform too. So we're seeing this uh, virtual cycle of more and more people joining the platform on the basis of that. Long term though, uh, just to elevate this discussion, um, you know, we are very, very bullish still, uh, and we're still in the early days uh, on this journey of going after um, the audio platform of the world. And that is still measured in billions of consumers. So we're still relatively early in that cycle. And just from a TAM perspective, you know, even today, um, you know, the radio industry is north of $50 billion. Most of that is advertising. Advertising today a small portion of the Spotify's business, but it will be a much bigger one overall. So that's an added potential benefit. Then on the subscriber side, um, as Japan and the US have shown before, uh, there are existing audio products that are monetized at much higher ARPUs than Spotify in those marketplaces. And I think um, you know the Spotify product and content mix is getting better by the day. And uh, over time, that gives us confidence that uh, we should have ability to be a significant player in subscription and um, have uh, pricing power as well going forward. So I think the combination of those two, um, growth will still be the priority given that we're talking about in the billions, uh, but I am very, very bullish on our ability, both on advertising and subscription long term. Okay, that, that concludes our uh, question and answer session. Uh, D Daniel, do you have any final closing remarks? Yeah, sure. Um, so in closing, uh, we had a very strong quarter. And as I mentioned just before, I've really never been more bullish about where we are today and our future opportunity. Um, and there's still billions of people who have yet to discover our on-demand music streaming or listen to a podcast. And of course, many more we have yet to reach in markets around the world where Spotify uh, doesn't yet exist. And speaking of podcasts, uh, the last thing I wanted to do is just to encourage you to check out Spotify's new For the Record podcast that's coming out this Friday. Uh, Paul and I will be sharing additional thoughts about the quarter, and we will be discussing my philosophy on growth, innovation, and uh, the importance of risk-taking. Uh, so uh, feel free to check that out, a uh, shameless plug. Uh, but thanks again for joining us this morning. Uh, this is an exciting time to be focused on audio, and we're only just getting started. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. The replay of the call will be available on our website and new for the first time, also on the Spotify app under Spotify Earnings Call Replays. Thanks again. This concludes the Spotify Q2 2020 earnings call. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.